from a law, but now it's a law. Many of us, Mike, I think, has had 20 years experience now. Monica, Michelle, Mary Ann, I, how long have you guys been I've in been practice? I've been in the 80s. 80s? Holy. Okay, so yeah, you and it, and, and it, But the way that they've set up certain words called collaborative divorce, and they're going to get into it more. And I've heard a bunch of presentations on that, and it's, it's, just a, it, it, it's just a better way for not only you to help save a deal, get more deals, and actually help your clients out to make it the process a lot smoother but it, it's just a great way and the funny thing about it is when they talked about this one it was about a month ago a month and a half ago i sent you an article from philadelphia yeah where they're like this is the new thing and it's going to blow up so get on it learn 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 about this now before you do this other product. it was a great article so i sent her an article i'm like man we got to get more of these things going to help out the agents but with that this is their expertise they're a great group um <coughs> Get to, get to know them, listen to them, take notes, and so. Okay, Thank, thank you. you, Anthony of Lawyer's Title. This is such a great public service. Um, I'm Jennifer Mosier, but I am in no way like the leader. We are all, every single person in this group, we are group-led, um, and we are, to be clear, just a group of professionals who are all collaboratively trained to essentially help clients, man, get the words out, to help clients who are struggling with divorce, facing divorce, or some other high stakes legal issue where they have an interest that's hard to divide and they have to continue to cooperate. It falls really well into divorce and family law. So uh, we have all been trained and we have all been practicing as collaborative practitioners, but we're not all lawyers. Uh, DJ gone, Heidi is Heidi Quinlan right here. Uh, these guys are mental health professionals. Mike, uh, don't judge them, don't judge them by that though. They're both terrific. And then Mike, <laughs> he is a financial expert and <coughs> terrific. The rest of the people, Mike in the blue shirt, um, is financial. And then Steve, Michelle are both attorneys. I've had cases against both of them. Um, you know, I walked in and hugged Steve. How often do you see that with lawyers who have sparred in a case against each other? Michelle and I are still <laughs> dealing with a collaborative case that Hopefully we can settle it soon. Monica and I have um, negotiated a prenup anti nut together. I uh, hope to have a case with you, a bigger case with you yeah. soon. And Marianne's the only attorney in here that I haven't had a case with yet. Uh, but that's just because collaborative law is so new. And we need your voices out there to tell people about this so that we create demand in the community. And in turn, lawyers will have to respond and provide this service. It is traditionally lower cost. That means less legal fees to the attorneys and more money to the <coughs> client's pockets. Why do we want to do this? Because we think it's the right thing for families and we think it's the right thing for our clients. So this new law, Rule 67.1, I'm going to delve, uh, Marianne's going to delve into that. I'm just going to turn the page here. This is what your clients are facing before they learn about Rule 67.1. Enacted in Arizona in 2016, it made this process available to every attorney in Arizona. So if your clients come to you and say, I'm going through a divorce, just mention, please, collaborative law, there's a new rule, ask your lawyer. Every attorney in Arizona can use this rule. The problem is most attorneys aren't trained and they don't know about it. So we're hoping to help turn that around and educate them and move, move everyone forward with this knowledge. Mary Ann, can you call everybody about the rule? Sure, do you want me to stand or is it okay if I sit? <laughs> okay. okay, collaborative law, originally collaborative divorce started in the 80s by some really smart people in Minnesota. And they saw how it benefited their families that they were working with, and then the movement spread across the United States. Um, you know, Arizona was a slow adopter of the Uniform Collaborative Law Act, but Jennifer said that they did adopt the rule in January of 2016. So what that rule did is really give um, the elements of what's required to do a true collaborative divorce. And if you go right now on the internet and Google collaborative divorce, every single lawyer in Maricopa County and every county in Arizona is gonna pop up. But the reality is there are very specific elements that are required to have a collaborative divorce. And the elements are very simple. They're twofold. You have to sign a collaborative commitment agreement or a collaborative participation agreement, depending on what you wanna call it. And each of the spouses must be represented by an independent <coughs> attorney. Okay? So once you have those two elements, you can move forward and have a collaborative divorce. If those elements aren't present, it doesn't matter if you call it a collaborative divorce, it simply is not. Um, the next um, key element is, is that you must have that collaborative participation agreement. 
um, our rule sets forth what the minimum requirements are for that agreement. So it has to be in writing. It has to be signed by both spouses. It has to state what issue you are dealing with for, collab for your collaborative law issue. Um, you have to identify the collaborative lawyer who's going to be representing each client. And that must contain a statement that's signed by each lawyer confirming that the lawyer's responsibility is limited to the collaborative law process. So those are the minimum elements. So depending on the needs of your family, um, there can be additional elements or additional requirements or additional concepts that you want to be in your written contract, which is your participation agreement. Participation agreement. And we're going to come back later and talk about maybe additional things that you might need for your particular family's needs. Um, you can do a collaborative law case at any point in the process. It's most cost effective and most beneficial, in my opinion, for the family to do it at the launch. But if for some reason there's been a case that has been started, um, one of the spouses went and filed a loan, for the petition to get the clock ticking for some reason, and now they are finding out about the collaborative process and they would like to do that, you can then transition a case to a collaborative divorce case under the rules. And what happens then is you notify the court that says, hey, we are now going to be using a collaborative law process in this case. And the key import is that because of this rule change, the courts will now let your clients and that family you're working with resolve the case on their own timeline. The court will not interfere in your case to make you do the ministerial acts or the procedural acts in order to keep your case moving along on the court's docket. They want to give you that space to come to your resolutions. Despite the fact that the court takes a hands-off approach, if for some the reason there was need for some type of emergency order. Your clients are never precluded to go to court on an emergency issue if there was some issue like that. It may result in the collaboration ending, but by agreeing to participate in collaboration, your clients are never giving up any of their rights. And that's sometimes um, a misperception of collaboration. Um, in collaboration, the agreement is that there will be voluntary, full, and thoughtful disclosure in your case. Our rules of court require full disclosure of basically everything. Arizona has one of the most broad um, disclosure requirements in a family law case, but this is all done voluntarily in a collaborative divorce case. Um, Another key element of the rule is that um, before you execute a participation agreement, there has to be an assessment whether your particular case would be appropriate for collaboration. Um, so that means that the lawyer has to have a conversation with his or her client that explains collaboration, explains how you end collaboration, and explains what happens if there is an end of collaboration. It must be an understanding of your client about how to terminate the process and what the effect of that is. Um, the, the other um, prong that must be assessed in determining whether or not your case should move forward in collaboration is there needs to be um, an assessment if there's a coercive or violent relationship. If those elements are present, it doesn't mean that the case shouldn't go forward in collaboration. What it means is there has to be an acknowledgement of that, and there has to be a determination if a safety plan can be put in place. And I'm not just talking about a safety plan where, okay, there are two exits for a room. I'm talking about a safety plan so that if you have a lesser educated client or a lesser powerful client, that there are safety mechanisms in place so that person can meaningfully, meaningfully participate in the collaboration. Um, if those are um, elements are present and the person who's the survivor of that type of coercive or violent relationship wants to pursue collaboration, that is absolutely permitted during the rules. So the last, we've talked about, each of you have to have a lawyer, there has to be full financial disclosure. And um, if 
one of the parties ends the collaboration and wants to have the court decide the issues. That means there is a litigated issue. In your collaboration, it will end, and the people that participated in the collaboration cannot go forward in the litigation. So whatever compromises or communications that happened in the collaboration can't be used against you. So the biggest question I receive from people is, well, I'm gonna to have to replace my lawyer. Why would I ever wanna go through that process of collaboration? And collaboration is one of the few processes that allows you truly to keep the process confidential. What is exchanged in collaboration is, com is confidential and there are privileges that apply to the communications that happened within your collaborative process. So depending on what your particular family situation is, the value of keeping your family business, your family information out of court um, has tremendous value and the rule absolutely provides for that. So that's kind of a summary. If anybody wants an actual copy of the rule, um, you're welcome to email me and I will provide it to you, but those are files. <laughs> Yeah. Now everybody has to repeat that back right now. <laughs> 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 oh. in the back. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question. What is the difference between this and going through like a mediation process? In mediation, um, you're working with one neutral. So the mediator's sole job is to be neutral to get two parties to come to some type of agreement they can work with. Okay. There can be information that is not transparent in mediation. There is no commitment in mediation that you'll do full disclosure other than saying, oh yeah, okay, I gave you everything. But cough, cough, they didn't give you the Bank of America account. And there is not necessarily lawyers who are participating in it, who are there um, not necessarily advocating for you, but making sure that you have all the legal information that you need so that you can make a decision. So this litigation with uh, both parties, both represented individually, and uh, so what you're doing is you're, you're trying to reach a point where you don't have to go into court. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. You're, you're, you're have your own people who are. Do you okay. have copies of this uh, to distribute, or is this something that I write down? We can, we can oh. copies. Okay. Let so me. the next slide we've moved on to is collaborative law versus litigation. Hold on a second. <laughs> Let me speak to that. Let me speak to that question just briefly because I think it's important. The job of the because I did settlement conferences for the court for years, and some of these other guys did as well. And we also do mediation. The job of the mediator is to get people to settle. In other words, when I would do settlement conferences for the court, my job was to force two people to come to an agreement if I could. Right? I was unsuccessful if I didn't get a deal. <laughs> And so it's it's a coercive process where you try and get both people to go away feeling like, well, I'm not happy with that, but I don't feel like I totally got screwed either, so I guess it's okay. Collaborative law is you all work together and hopefully at the end everybody walks away going, you know, that was that was okay. I feel pretty good about this. I feel like, you know, I was part of the process. We agreed on things in a rational way and come away hopefully with a lot better result and a better feeling about it at the end. So that's the one difference. The other difference is mediation is usually at the tail end of the litigation in most cases or at least after you've been through a bunch of money. You burn through a bunch of money with lawyers before you get to mediation. <coughs> Collaborative you start right from the beginning with that process so you don't you don't spend a whole lot of time and money just sending letters back and forth and sending documents back and forth and doing all the stuff that we all hate to do but we have to. Okay. I was going to say, just to add to that, the biggest difference I see is the lack of information that is often present in mediations to kind of speak to what they were talking about is most people are coming in and they might think it's a good agreement because they don't understand what the laws entitle them to. And often what I see in mediation is a, a power imbalance where one actually has a better understanding of the finances and sometimes what the law would entitle them. And as mediators, it's not our place to advise on the law. Unless we see something that is completely unfair, I've called mediation and said, I feel like you need to talk to an attorney before we proceed to understand what you're agreeing to. 
but I can't make them go get legal advice as a mediator. The nice thing in collaborative is the attorneys are there in the room and the financial, so there's full disclosure of what the law would allow, what it would provide for, what the finances are. I mean, I have two cases right now with Mike here where one of the parties said, hey, something doesn't look right in the numbers, I think we're missing an account. I didn't even have to get involved. All Mike did was send a group email to my client saying, hey, it seems like our records might be incomplete. Is there anything else missing? And they coughed up the documents, right? I didn't even have to get involved. Had that been a mediation, it might not have even been caught because we don't have a financial looking at the documents saying something doesn't seem right. Your expenses outweighs the income that should be coming into the house. Something doesn't add up. Where's the money going? So that's the benefit I see in collaborative is everyone has the same information and we're working with the same information. That is almost never present in a mediation. One quick question, there's so much cooperation going mm -hmm. on, getting through that process. Do they reconcile and then not get the divorce and I don't get the divorce? Sometimes. Don't give me that little war stories. Yeah, Jennifer, so what? Yeah. Jennifer and I are working on a case right now where we think that might be the delay that's going on um, with actually signing. So it does sometimes, in it fact, my clients said, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we do have just families. Just no. <laughs> Well, and I mean, I, I've had families say to me, we are communicating better now than we ever did yeah. in the marriage. Sometimes it leads to reconciliation, sometimes it just means they're better co-parents right. because they can right. now communicate in the best interest of the child and not be fighting. But I get that all the time. We communicate better now than we ever did when we were married. But can the seller cancel without there being any legal repercussions or? It hasn't hit the market yet. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I kind of walked in mid-story there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, this is, this, is about, this is about reconciliation of the marriage. And mm -hmm. so sometimes people will reconcile. And, and then and during this process, I've had that happen. I actually sadly have somebody who um, is a public figure here in, in town and who badly wants reconciliation and cannot be talked into collaborative law and doesn't know just how close they might have gotten to reconciling with my client had they just agreed to it. Because um, my client would be open. And, um, and so that, that will, that's coming down the road. But um, reconciliation is painful to happen of marriages and collaborative law all the time. Um, and I've had four so far like, that I've kept yes. track of in the last three four years. Four listings that didn't hit the market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I terrible. Know. And that is why I, I would, I would have really consider in the market to sell homes, right? But here's, here's, what, here's what the flip side of this is. They reconcile and they agree, you know what? One of the issues is we have too many financial problems. We have yeah. that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to sell our homes because yeah. we are living yeah. beyond yeah. our means. Mm -hmm. Versus we are locked in litigation for three years. We've agreed to sell the home a year and a half ago. The poor realtor is running around in circles and we can't get one party or the other. We've got to get a court order to get every <coughs> single part of the contract signed. That's not fun. So with the collaborative <laughs> process, you have full cooperation by both people in all decisions, or the, the process has to terminate. So do you guys find as, as attorneys that it is collaborative versus a traditional litigated different your role is totally different. You're not, I mean, that's the thing is jumping to me. Oh, yeah. I've been through a pretty nasty divorce, and yeah. your job as attorneys was to piss us off to churn more fees. I really felt that way. This doesn't seem, this is the opposite. I'm having lunch next week with a client and a, an opposing counsel. At my client's request, opposing counsel, me and the client are all having lunch together. We're all social. Yeah, that would never happen. Yeah, right. That's, so it's well, a completely I mean, we've gotten along for how long now? We've been doing, we've been together trying to get collaborative law. Over a year now. So we had a single fight? Yeah. No. It's a mindset shift, and it's why it's not for every Major attorney, shift. but we are working towards getting attorneys to see this is a better outcome for families that it's appropriate, but it's a huge mindset shift because it's no longer about advocating to win versus making sure your client understands their legal rights and helping them in facilitating brainstorming sessions to find solutions, which is not what we're trained to do. It's not what we did before we started this. So it takes a huge mindset shift to get here. Did you ever have someone reconcile while the house was in escrow? I have, a, I have a case right now that's going to be collaborative. Probably, I just met with the client yesterday, and she's in, she's like, I know my husband's going to agree to this because he's very conflict avoidant. <laughs> they're going to have to sell their house, and they're but the, but their issue is they're going to need to sell their house only with an agreement because they're going to be like two ships in the night and not able to cooperate. They're fighting on things, and they're going to ultimately have more conflict around selling their house if they 
do it now versus wait then the collaborative process and then enlist the realtor and and you know that's one thing that we we all do is we make contact with realtors connections with realtors title um, the lenders anybody that they need so that we can put them in touch with the right people to help work with them but I will tell you to answer your question I have not had a case where the house was actually in escrow because it's usually one of two things. They've already agreed to sell the home, they've listed, they've now decided to get a divorce, but they're already in agreement with that's the plan, or they're in complete disagreement about what should happen to the home, who should get it, whether it should be sold or maintained. Through the collaborative process, we resolve that issue, then they go list. I've never had where it's in escrow and they're fighting. Well, and the only reason I ask is, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a, a sucker and a romantic as, as far as, you know, people wanting to get back together. It's a beautiful thing. I would encourage it. But, you know, a contract is legal and binding. You just yeah. can't cancel Correct. as a seller. Because yeah, there's you, a remedy. They lose their earnest money, right? But that's why I said generally our approach is going to be let's get well, resolution. They don't lose their earnest money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so, we're generally um, fall before the house yeah. is listed. Okay. Yeah. Well, you won't have problems when it gets listed because okay. both people are going to be on Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Or call, to save, or call to save that sale and make that actually happen right. meaningfully as opposed to just with all budget conflicts, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. Um, yeah, actually, that's more likely to happen if they're in litigation. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. much more likely to happen um, than it is going to be in the collaborative process because they're working towards a common goal. Whereas litigation, they're in opposition with each other. So one thing we want everyone in the room and everyone listening online to be able to do, the people listening online, um, to be able to do is to you know kind of tell your clients about what an attorney does do. And I know we've kind of we've kind of talked about that a little bit, but Monica, you were going to give a little bit more in depth information about the role of the attorney. Well, and I have I think the you've got a couple of slides before that, and this leads into it as well. <coughs> um, in a collaborative divorce, we've talked about some of the basic features. Each spouse gets their own attorney. The attorney should be trained in collaborative law for it to be a successful process, but they don't have to be trained in collaborative law in order to participate under that rule 67.1. Um, the training is invaluable because like Michelle was saying, doing this is a total shift in what we do. When you go to law school, when you practice law, when you're mentored in traditional adversarial practice, your mindset is how do I win for my client? The attorney's role in a collaborative case is not about winning. It's not an us versus them idea. It's a very team-oriented approach where the attorney's role isn't to drive the bus. It's to navigate and help their own client to know what decisions that they need to make. So each spouse gets their own attorney. Everybody has to sign that collaborative participation agreement. That's not just the attorneys and the clients. It's anybody else who joins their collaborative team. And we've got people who will be serving in different roles on the team. Sometimes those people are known right from the get-go. Sometimes you don't know until the case has gone on a little further who might we need to help join in this process. But anybody who's part of the collaborative team has to sign the agreement because that's the agreement that says that if for some reason it falls out of collaborative, everybody on the team has to withdraw. And that includes all of the professionals that have been involved at any step of that collaborative process. So the process itself involves a series of meetings, and it's pretty structured, actually. When you start the case, everyone sits down with their calendars, and you plan out the next three or four months. This is when the attorneys are going to meet with their clients. This is when our whole team is going to meet together. This is when the clients are going to meet with the financial neutral. This is when the clients are going to meet with their communication specialist or their child specialist and prepare everything so that when we're all sitting in the same room at the same time, we can actually get everything done because all of the information has been shared and all of the different steps have been taken to lay it out. Nobody's waiting on anybody else to do something. The lawyer is there to advise their clients. We're not there to talk them into or out of anything. We're there to let them know these are some of the legal options that you might not have been aware of when you are deciding what your options are in going forward. Maybe the question is, well, what does the law say on this? What would a judge do if we went to court? And we can answer the question. If I have a case and Jennifer's on the other side and my client asks a question, she can answer it. That's fine with me. She knows the same law I do. We can speak freely among our team because we're not there in an us versus them scenario. Of course, she's not going to give my client legal advice, and I'm not going to give her client legal advice. 
but they see us supporting each other from the legal side, which is supporting them in knowing that they're going to be making a decision that's based on objectively. What does the law say? What kind of financial information do we have? How have we used our communication tools? And all of it comes together. <coughs> Excuse me. So the kinds of experts that we use, we use very frequently a neutral financial expert. Michael's going to talk about that. Somebody who can gather all the data that the clients have and put it in a format that they can use, that we can all use. Uh, family communication specialist. Sometimes we call that a communication coach. Those words are not exactly interchangeable, but to us, we use the same function. Somebody who can help the parties who probably haven't been communicating all that well to learn how to <coughs> say what they need to say and hear what the other person needs to say and still be able to get through some difficult conversations. Um, there's also a child specialist, not listed on this sheet, but I know you guys are going to talk about that, who give the children a voice in the process. So the collaborative divorce is the entirety of the team coming together. And when agreements are reached, and I'm going to say when, not if, even though the slide says if, a consent decree is drafted, meaning the attorneys do what lawyers do. We draft the paperwork. So like I said, we're not there to drive the bus, but we'll pull it into the garage once you guys decide where it is that you want to go. So talking about the financial neutral, I'll skip the qualifications of an attorney. There are a few slides I skipped over because we've talked about them already, sort of in our group, and we, we will absolutely <coughs> love to send in the PowerPoint in a PDF format to anyone who wants to leave their card. I'll we'll send it to Mike. Come on in. The financial neutral fills a, a somewhat unique role in that they are neutral. They're not representing either party that, like the attorneys do. They've been brought in to do what's typically probably the most arduous part of a divorce process, which is gather the information. Because ultimately what you want is all the cards are on the table, they're all face up, everybody knows what they say, they know what they mean. Because as was mentioned earlier, especially in mediation, there's often kind of a power or an information imbalance between the parties. One of them managed the finances, one of them didn't. Well, one of them's probably at a disadvantage. So what the financial neutral does is gathers up all that information and it's gotta be freely disclosed because like I'm working on a case right now where the person's self-employed, their expenses far exceed the reported income. So I know that the tax return is totally bogus. So I need to find out what is that real income. And by working with the attorneys and the coach, that gets fully disclosed until everybody is satisfied that all their questions have been answered. It's only then that the full team meets for the parties to start figuring out, okay, how are we gonna divvy everything up? Because it's not only the assets, it's also the cash flow. Um, which should be of interest to everybody here, is that if they can't make that mortgage payment, it's gonna be a problem. And so making sure that the cash flow works for both parties is just as important as divvying up the assets and making sure that happens equitably. The other thing that I do is help explain things to people that may not be familiar. For example, if a client has restricted stock units or they have stock options or anything like that, or there's a business, how do you value the business? Those kinds of issues, they get answered so that people can make informed decisions. Um, and so I'm neutral in gathering the information. I verify that information so that when the report does go to the attorneys, instead of spending hours digging through financial statements and stuff, they're up to speed in about five minutes. Um, and they know that that information has been vetted. Um, if there's additional information required, then we go get it. Understanding how do we properly value assets, whether it's 401ks, if there's a business, um, if there's going to do an offset, for example, one spouse is going to keep the house, but there's no other asset to offset that equity, maybe they're going to use a 401k. Well, does that mean you make a tax adjustment in that because you're talking after tax and pre-tax dollars. So doing those kinds of calculations to let them know what that looks like. But more importantly, as they make each of these individual decisions, developing a scenario so that they can each see what does the culmination of all these individual decisions look like in total? What assets am I going to get? Will I be able to pay my bills every month? Things like that. Because in divorce, people are scared to death that they're going to make a mistake. 
And if they can see in black and white that, hey, I will be able to pay my bills every month, I am getting my fair share of things like that, that makes them much more inclined to say yes. And <coughs> the financial professional has a very specific background. One, as has been mentioned a couple of times, they're trained in collaborative divorce because it is a different role than my role as a financial planner. I'm not telling my clients what to do, I'm helping to assist them in making decisions because ultimately in collaboration it's the party's decision. And then I'm also a certified divorce financial analyst, a certified financial planner, and just as importantly been trained in mediation because this is a different process, it's a different mindset. And so while I do testify in litigated cases, the reason all of us are here is we hate litigation because you can win or lose, but the process is just gut-wrenching. And it puts the family through a tremendous amount of turmoil and they spend a boatload of money they don't need to spend to end up with a worse result. Um, you know, we've all seen it that the last thing you want to do is let a judge decide anything. Much better that the husband and wife can make their own decisions. Um, so the role of the financial neutral, like the communications coach, is to be truly neutral. You're not advocating for either party, you're helping to facilitate their ability to make informed decisions. And that's really one of the key components of this process is they drive the bus and they make all the decisions about where the terms, we just try to keep them in the guardrails. And in my experience, it's been really successful. Question. Yeah. What's the typical <coughs> timeline uh, from start to finish? Uh, they typical the clients are in control. You can do it in as little as 60 days. Um, or faster if you really wanted to. But it's when we schedule out the meetings up front, they know exactly how this is going to progress and when hopefully they're <coughs> going to be done. And typically in that process, we schedule one extra meeting hoping we're not going to need it, just in case. But that way everybody's schedule's coordinated. They know if they've got homework to do for me, they know when they have to have it done because they're going to meet with me individually and together, and they better have their stuff done. And if I'm not getting it in a timely fashion, I reach out to the attorney, I reach out to the coach, and say, hey, they're kind of dragging their feet a little, help me out here. And they do. And it's never an issue. What's, very, the, what's, very, the, what's the biggest motivator for, for one side or the other to be honest and divulge the information? Because I'm very good at what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, persua so it's persuasion. I mean, there's persuasion involved. Well, and, and even if they're not. So we had a case a number of years ago where there was a condo in China. I was on that case. <laughs> you were going to say that. <laughs> that wasn't disclosed. And it came out. And... As a team, we figured out how do we get this out there, and the case progressed, got resolved, and it was fine. But part of that is fear, because I have a couple of stories I tell about things like that. But they're not afraid, and that's the big difference, is in litigation, you try to hide things because it's what you don't say can't be used against you later. But if it comes out in the process, then there is ways to get it in, out there without losing face. And that's part of what the team is about. Yeah. You know, because most, you know, from my perspective, I've never married, I've never been divorced, like a lot of friends that have had. So, you know, I've gotten educated on you know, what they've gone through, but most of it is because one party, a lot of times for men, feel like they're going to get killed. And that's the difference in litigation because there's a winner and there's a loser. There's a perception of I have to somehow hide things or take steps to protect myself because the court's not going to protect me, right? I'm going to be hurt if I don't protect myself. That goes away in the collaborative process because it's about how do both of you get what you need to be okay and what do the kids need if there's kids in the case. So it's about working together to make sure that everyone has what they need to be okay. That is not the case in litigation. It's I'm going to take from you to be okay at your expense. And that's why you get the hiding of assets that we don't see in collaborative. 
Um, I like to believe when assets are found that it wasn't intentional, unlike the condo that clearly was. Um, <laughs> But, you know, those things come up, but the nice thing, like Mike said, is there's a way to bring it up in a group and allow the person to save face, own up that it happened, and say, right. okay, now what do we do with it? In litigation that happens? No. There's punishments. There's Discovery consequences. Yeah. Right? And so you have even more incentive to hide that stuff because it, of it, that. It's almost kind of a peer yeah. pressure thing. Mm -hmm. I'm in a case now where the wife had a $30,000 bonus from last year, and she really thought that was just her money. It wasn't community property, so she she gave it to her mother. <laughs> Didn't say anything to anybody. And one of our other financial neutrals, not Mike, is in that case. And we we get we all got together for one of our meetings. She said, "Hey, uh, you know, I see these three ninety five hundred dollar checks over to your mother because she went through all their bank records." Right? She goes, "What was that for?" And she had this kind of stunned look on her face. She goes, "Well, that was my bonus. I thought I could." No. <laughs> so she was fine. That Arizona's community property state, uh, you know, makes this makes this work better, or makes it you know better than states that aren't community property. Doesn't really it matter because the law is one option. Mm -hmm. Okay, as I explain to clients, here's what the law would say. Here's what each of you might consider fair, and it may not be the same. And ultimately, there's what do you decide to do. The law may be one, or one of you thought was fair. What maybe in the middle, but ultimately you're gonna to agree to something that works as well as possible for both of you. And taking that fear out of not knowing what does that look like in total is part of what gets you to settlement. See, uh, property, let's say property is held in trust. Uh, I mean, there's, there are different situations with real estate uh, that would you know, be different from you know, how they how they have ownership of the property or Say the property was in a trust, or uh, the property was held, you know, in a different, uh, was a joint tenancy or something, or I don't know. Is there, is there a situation in the real estate that it was owned a different way? Arizona isn't a state that's driven by how things are held. We're a state that's driven by whose money went into that asset and whose money, who's, who, for instance, you know, did, did, you know, if I'm married hypothetically and my husband's family. You know, gives him a hundred thousand dollars to buy a home for us, and he can clearly show that that money, you know, however the property was held, that that money went into um, the asset. Then that would be money that would be separate property for him. It would be a gift. And so Arizona isn't driven by assets. There, there is such a thing as commingling at some point, and we, it, it, that gets a little bit complex. There are, gosh, I just sent you guys all that my little cheat sheet on. Uh, specialization cases for Arizona, not that I specialize, just that I, I uh, like to use that list. And uh, there's probably, what, 20 cases that deal with is it community property or is it not? There's a lot of interpretations by our Court of Appeals on that issue. But ultimately, the titling issue is um, it, it, we don't look at how things are titled. You can hold something in your name, but if you're married, um, if, if community funds led to that asset, then community funds will be somehow redistributed out of that asset. And so the property was purchased before marriage? That's separate property, generally speaking. It depends on whether or not further funds from the community are put into that asset after the marriage, then the community may have a lien. That's what you determine afterwards, what was contributed after marriage. Yep, and Mike does that. Mike does that. He looks at, okay, well, here's the date of marriage, March 1st, and you made two months, you made two months of payments here, and now we're at December 31st, and we've got 10 months of payments. Um, and, you know, so we look at, where the, where sort of the, the balance that, that is. also have, have, have to uh, determine equity? You know, what, you know, if you're going to sell the property and, you know, I had 100000 I had 200000 in the property, uh, you know, and her contribution was uh, half of the mortgage payments for a, two years. Uh, and so that plus appreciation. And that's where you get people to agreement because mm -hmm. just to take Jennifer's to a litigated <clears throat> finality, so let's say that parents did gift $100,000, they put it in the house, title in a joint name. If you're in front of a judge, there's every conceivable reason that judge is going to say fully community property because it's titled both names. We had that case. Tough luck. Uh, okay. But in collaboration, that's where you get the sense of fairness because the other party may acknowledge, yeah, they did that and that would be fair. But judges take the easy way out. 
and now just say, hey, you joint, joint my own. 50, 50. You guys as attorneys, if your client asks you, if I go to court, how would this be treated? You're that sure person that is giving up, they're yeah. potentially giving up money to make this in collaborative versus. But there's a sense of fairness that they expect on the other side too. It doesn't it's always happen. Really, it's just, that's such a heightened. Well, I want to ask, ask, ask you. I want to ask you. That's why we have a coach. I want to ask you something about uh, if you buy stock for twenty dollars a share, and then you get to turn around and sell sell that stock for twenty dollars a share. How do you feel? What about, if, what about if you sell it for seventeen dollars a share? That's litigation. You're selling your stock that you can be paid in twenty dollars, and you collaborative. You're selling it more like forty dollars a share. Even if you come out a little behind, maybe you maybe get to give some of that money away. You're still coming out ahead. Litigation is at best a wash, and usually you're you're going to spend more to chase after that asset than you ever are to get it back. But I'm just if, if I'm if I'm the spouse of somebody whose parents put in a hundred grand, mm -hmm. and if I go to court, I'm going to get fifty of that. But if I go collaborative, I'm going to be fair and leave that fifty off the table. That takes a certain kind of person to say that's okay. But you're assuming that the judge is going right. to agree yeah. that she gets yeah. that back. You're the also assuming that's that there's all not over the board. The judge is in between there. There are options well. between not all. The judge could also say, well, you know, the judge could also say, I'm going to look beyond the transaction and look at the whole transaction. Yeah. Yeah. The judge could also say, I'm going to look beyond this transaction and the yeah. husband gets his whole hundred thousand dollars back. So yeah, we spent 15 the, the on the yeah. 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 I'm all for the guy turning out to go get 100 grand. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I just, that's, man, so, you know, that's we follow about that. Horror story. What I will tell you is what I typically tell my clients is I say, yeah, we can go there, but let's talk about what that could look like. You could have a judge who agrees with you. You could have a judge who agrees with your spouse. Let me tell you how much it's probably going to cost you conservatively to get there. I will tell you, whatever splitting that difference is, is usually wiped out by the attorney's fees. So you're back at ground zero anyway. So then I say, what is it that you would like? What would you like to get? Because typically they have different interests that they want to accomplish and different goals. So wife may be willing to give up that money because there's something else she would rather have. And now that becomes a discussion, right? How do we achieve what you both want? But usually the big thing is whatever it's whatever that difference is of splitting it down the middle is usually attorney's fees plus. Which is, is what I typically see. That's why I use this yeah, stock. You're gonna think you're gonna um, never get all your money you out. You spend more of attorney's fees than you are. You had complicated divorce. So you know that you spend more right. you, you, you live it. If people that fight over a, a chest of drawers and spend you know, twenty thousand dollars to fight over a thousand dollar piece of furniture. Or something that you sell use for three hundred bucks. So let's talk about the, the human piece. I'm gonna try to talk about the the, the globalness mm -hmm. and the human aspect of this as a mental health professional that, that works in this area and I've done Litigated divorces for over 40 years, where the <coughs> court is being appointed to do custody evaluations, psychological evaluations, and other things. And I've seen how destructive it is. And I also want to talk about what, what comes back to you guys in, in your profession. Why would you want to refer somebody here? And what's in it for you? Those kind of things. First of all, I will tell you, you can take it to the bank. This is a kinder, gentler, better way of doing a dissolution of marriage carried any sense. Everybody at this table has got great experience. They'll all tell you the same thing. That's why we're here. Because we can all make, we can all grind out money, like somebody said, an attorney grinding out fees. Everybody in this room that's an attorney can grind out fees and, and, and escalate divorces. And we know the attorneys in town who do that. We have a, we have a short list of horrible people, the next list of almost horrible people, and then, there's, and then there's people that really want to help people get their divorce over and move on. So that's the main reason to do a collaborative divorce. We've got a team of people that will help. Their knowledge will be at financial specialists and attorneys. People are going to be fully informed. When I sit down with people for the first time, I say to them, uh, I call this Dr. Gong's rule. I stole this from the collaborative divorce thing I did, uh, some I did many years ago. And it's all open source, you know, like links, links us and all that stuff. So I steal it and let's call it Dr. Gong's rule. My job is to help you bridge the gap to reach some agreements that you can live with moving forward into the future. And this isn't like a, a hump on your back and a limp. Because I went once, I had somebody say, well, I guess you can live with anything. Everybody usually gets it, but I had one person once not one time said that. And I said to him, it's not like having a lump on your back and a limp. It's something that you can genuinely walk away from this process with and say, you know, this is, I'm, I'm gonna be okay. And my kids are gonna be okay. And my spouse who I may still love or I may hate their guts, <laughs> 
but they're going to be okay, and I can look myself in the mirror and <coughs> shoot them and, and leave them screwed. Okay. Um, so it's about pulling those things together. In terms of what comes back to you, first of all, is goodwill. I can almost promise you that in almost every case, psychologists never say 100% Quite part of the profession. <laughs> Almost in every case, you'll be able to say, uh, and they'll be able to say to you, thank you so much for referring me. The goodwill and the referrals from the next client to the next client. You, you know, I worked with so and so on selling my house and doing this stuff, and they sent me these two. It, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. They're going to be thinking of you first for everything. They're going to be thinking of you for their next house and, or the house after that. Uh, you're going to make a friend for life by helping them find their way to have a kinder, gentler divorce, uh, a better product that doesn't bankrupt them with attorney's fees and, and bad outcomes. Uh, so that's why I want to say just in general about the collaborative process for you to think about. Now, when we talk about the communication specialists, sometimes called coaches, and this is kind of a, a running joke, at least with me, with the group, I don't like the term coach because I don't want to have to put my hat on backwards and take a whistle when I've got a PhD and 40 years experience. Okay. Uh, it's not like bouncing basketballs back and forth. It's more complicated than that. But the coach term came from the early work in Minnesota. And so nationally, that's how that term's been used. But we also call ourselves a communication specialist. And they're always licensed professionals, um, in, in, at least in our group, uh, either master's level or PhD professionals. And we are not therapists in this role. We are there to assist in communication. If they need a therapist, we refer them out. In other words, if I'm a communication specialist and somebody needs a therapist, I may refer them over to Heidi. She's not on the case. It's a separate role. Or she might refer back or you might refer to somebody else in the community that we know. But they're not, it's not a therapy role. Now, if you want a therapy role, Heidi's terrific. And I'm okay, too. So, you know, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for someone that needs help for their child or for help for themselves or the other spouse or something emotional, Certainly you can refer to Best Legal Choices and we will help if it's not one of us, if it's the best fit. We know the community well enough that we can find the best fit person for you, for you to, to do and, and, and refer them to. So that's a whole other side piece with the mental health professionals. But I want to let you know there's two ways that you can go. One is you know that somebody needs some help dealing with their divorce, addressing issues and needs some, to someone to talk to maybe. That's something that's outside of collaborative divorce. That's something that's also available here. But what we do here is help people communicate with each other effectively. And you, you take an assessment of what their needs are. Uh, I would be in communication with Michael. If he was on a case, he would, he would communicate with me and say, here's the snags. Uh, Dad's really emotionally attached to the house because uh, he has classic cars in his garage and this is his workshop and he can't imagine me being here. It's like, whatever it is. And so we can be aware of those things and I can talk to the husband, the wife, the children, and, and, and work with all three of them. Sometimes we break those, those roles out. We have a separate uh, communication specialist for mother, a separate for dad, and then a, a child specialist, which I just will talk about in just a minute. Sometimes they're combined, sometimes they're separated. It depends on the case and the dynamics and how much is, is going on where the needs are, but we'll assess that as a team and make recommendations for that. So in the end, uh, rather than trying to be real specific about what we do, I'd like you to just get the general concept <coughs> that there's another level of help for people. Oh, yes? I mean, is, is it safe to say that even if you have legal high ground that you cannot count that things will go your way? I mean, I, I have a friend <laughs> who you know, was working with a, a, a couple that was divorcing, and they were just, they couldn't agree, they were bickering. The judge got sick of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and told the agent, ordered the agent, didn't tell him, ordered the agent to slash the house $80,000 and to take the first offer that came in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I, I can really see some value well, in what you guys are doing, because right, if you right, pull right. that stuff in court, you know, the and judge may not be one, that. One of the roles that we do as a communication specialist, is that one of the cases yeah, that we're yeah. on, is, you know, sometimes, you know, obviously in divorce, people have different communication styles, and that's one of the conflict points. 
and it's helping each one understand in this process. Like Michelle said earlier, we communicate much better now than we ever did while we were married. And it's kind of helping them understand, you know, so-and-so thinks like this, or so-and-so thinks like this, and if we want to get through this, this is what I need you to understand. Or this is the approach that the team has to take. And we may talk amongst the team, we need to be a little bit more this way or directed with this person, but we need to give this person more time to think when we say things or check in with them more, take more breaks, something like that. So we kind of kind of work through those things so that they don't get to that point. You, you and, if we, and we watch kind of the body language and kind of say, say okay, you know what? I think I see someone fidgeting. I, I can tell their wheels are turning. Let's take a break right now and kind of, just kind of check in where we are. Okay. And so we kind of just monitor things and make sure that people aren't, you know, are keeping things moving and on track and staying focused and being respectful of each other so we don't get to that point. You don't want a judge making these decisions for you. That's what you're saying. I could give you a 50-year-old case that my mother needed to leave my father and the judge said that the, the uh, house had to be sold at auction. And my mother freaked out she didn't need to leave my father, by the way. <laughs> she had a legitimate reason to go. And, uh, but she stayed for another five or 10 years because she wasn't prepared. Well, she wasn't willing to see the house go away and for her to get almost nothing out of it. It was sold at auction. That's how they did it back then. And to your uh, point, so, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Dr. Well, uh, that's okay. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're talking, you're preaching to the choir here because you're identifying exactly what's wrong with litigating cases. Judges make arbitrary decisions, cut the baby in half, all that kind of stuff. And well, and we're going to be the ones that have to cut the baby. Well, <laughs> right. so. Wouldn't would it be nicer yeah. to be able to sell the house in an agreement, in an agreement mm -hmm. and to take the time it needs to sell the house and get the price that the, the house should bring rather than have something rammed down mm -hmm. parents' throats? That's not going to make the people that you're working with feel better about you. I mean, they may like you, but the, the whole process gets sour. And Whether you do a good case, job or not. Yeah. Whether yeah. you do the best job in the world, it doesn't feel good for them. And I will say, I mean, your point that you raise, while it may be an extreme that a judge says slash the price, it's not extreme to say a judge says it has to be sold within a certain period of time. I had a case where the judge ordered it because the parties could not agree, ordered the real estate agent to put it on the market and sell it before December 27th. Right? Have fun putting a house on the market. It was an early November case when the order came out. So they had one, six weeks to sell right during the holidays. So effectively, the judge said, slash the value of that home, right? Or they were going to be held in contempt with severe sanctions. So the reality is, it hurts the families. It hurts you. You've worked really hard, and now your commissions are being impacted because they can't agree. Contrast that with the case I had just last year. A real estate agent referred the family to me. The real estate agent worked with them to sell their home and then turned around and worked with both of them to buy new homes. That agent got three transactions out of it because the family worked together through the collaborative process, right? That's the value to you guys because they that couple looked to that realtor as someone who turned them to collaborative, helped them through one of the worst things that they're going to experience besides a major illness or death, and I would argue a divorce is as bad as a death for that family. Worse. Exactly. And not only helped them with that house, got them in the collaborative, but then they trusted that realtor. She turned around and got their next two transactions and then additional referrals. So that's the value to you guys is you're helping these families. So personally, that probably feels really good. You're helping yourself get deals done, but you're also going to earn their trust and respect and further referrals from them. And to add on that, you're going to establish yourself as somebody who's one of the most informed people mm -hmm. among the people that you that you compete against, frankly, in this industry. I mean, you're all trying to, everyone who is a realtor is trying to get the clients' homes and get them sold or get mm -hmm. them, you know, help them purchase. And if you can establish yourself as someone who's uniquely qualified in that industry to help, deal, help people deal with literally the, the very thing that could stand in their way at some point, that's something that I think will repay itself dividends for you and goodwill. I and mean, just and their faith in you. And I would add to that too, you made a comment about the person with the legal high ground. Mm -hmm. In collaborative, there's no high ground. Everyone's on a level <coughs> playing field because both sides have attorneys and there are neutral professionals who help guide through all of the different steps. And so if you're in a position where you identify that there's a power imbalance between the couple, one of them is driving everything related to their transaction, 
that's an opportunity to say, this is gonna go through much smoother if I can help them into a situation where we do have a more level playing field. Because it doesn't always happen when you've got a litigated <laughs> case or in a mediation, but in collaborative, we're all on level ground. Hmm. Uh, just two questions. You mentioned you know, in litigation there's you know, fees and it's gonna get ugly, it's gonna cost you money, leave your stock at $17, so that's bad. Um, so what's your alternative value proposition? Do you have a fixed fee where it's less expensive to go through your process, or what's your cost? Well, I want to I want to answer that. I think that's a that's a great question, and I want to answer that in a way that it's it's probably a little bit more of an it answers it, but also gives you more information than you're asking for. In collaborative process, all of those tax returns and all of those affidavits of financial information and all of the disclosure that I normally have to look at is gone. That goes to Mike, that goes to DJ. And so they actually deal with the psychological issues or the, you know, can they parent? Can, I mean, do they have a house in China? So instead, I get the luxury of actually caring. And I have a client right now, as a good example, who has an international abduction case. I don't get, I know she's petrified. I don't get to care about her feelings right now. It's litigation. I don't get to care about our feelings. I don't have that luxury. I get to care whether or not I cross every T and dot every I. Yes, I do care. But I don't get to focus, but in collaborative, I do. I get to actually spend time with you. If you're my client, I'm gonna sit down with you and say, you know what, I know that you're really attached to the garage because you, you, know, you worked on cars there and you love that. And that was the time you spent with your son when he was six and seven growing up and you were teaching him. I don't have that conversation with clients in litigation. Not, not a lengthy one, I can't. I can't afford it because they can't afford it. I'm going through their tax returns and I'm looking to make sure I have all the disclosure done and all the I's crossed and I, I've dotted and the T's crossed. And so I, I can spend a, more time with you caring about you and connecting with you and what's really important to you and driving this for you in collaborative. And I still don't even come close to the amount of time that I'll spend on that pile of documents for a litigation client. So I, I might, the time I would spend talking with you and caring about you and establishing what your legal rights may be and what your needs may be and how those juxtapose would probably be 20 to 30% of the time that I would just have to spend making sure I review documents that I'm going to trial to prepare for. So, so it's just less billable hours if you're collaborating? A lot less. A well, lot less. and it's shifting among the professionals too because yeah. it might take me twice as long to know what I'm looking for in a tax return that he goes straight to and knows what he's looking for in half the time. Uh -huh. So the attorney's not trying to wear all the hats. We yep. got the right person wearing the right hat and the cost savings is in not trying to mix with each of our different areas of specialty. <coughs> and it ends up with fewer hours being put in altogether over what just the attorneys put in, plus then their expert witnesses. Because if I'm litigating a case, I may want someone like a Mike just on my side, and Jennifer may want yeah, someone yeah. like a Mike on right. her side, and now we've doubled what these clients and are paying instead of having them work with the same <coughs> professional. The big difference in litigation, Monica's going to gather information. She's going to say, I want the exact same information from you, Michelle. Never mind that half their accounts are joint. I'm going to insist she give me her client's records. She's going to insist she gets them. We're each going to spend time going through the exact same financial records. We're potentially going to bring in another financial person to look at those records again in litigation. Whereas here, they just all go to Mike. And we trust that the information we get has been vetted. So now we're just looking at a four or five page report as opposed to stacks of documents. One, well, and the bigger, not, yeah, the, the bigger issue on that is you keep the case from spinning out of control. So you've got your discovery issues mm -hmm. and things like that. But if you can reach a settlement in a meeting or two, as opposed to emotions getting out of hand, because divorce is about kids and money. And you have the legal, but you also have the emotional side of that. And it's when it spins out of control, the costs just balloon almost uncontrollably. Collaboration keeps that from happening. I was gonna say, Jennifer was talking about, you know, she can only spend so much time with the client. In the meantime, they're calling each other outside of the attorneys and you know, arguing up. about this and stirring up and kind of attacking here, attacking there. Then they get back and say, all right, never mind, I changed my mind and blah, blah, blah. And now this blew up and that blew up. And now they have to redo things. It's costing more and more and more because of the pieces. Where in collaborative, we can keep that emotion down. We can help them, DJ and I, can help them meet individually, talk about what's the hurt that's underneath that's causing all this, keep them from doing that so we can keep the process 
focus, we can keep it shorter, we can keep everyone moving in the direction of their shared interest, which is to basically get through this relatively unharmed. Everyone's, you know, fearful, everyone's hurt, everyone's sad, everyone's grieving. It's like when we get through those emotions, we can help people work together more and come up with something that's more beneficial at the end than something in the end where, again, win, 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 I gotta get mine, I gotta get mine, because now you're scaring me because I don't trust you anymore. So we kind of eliminate that which makes this process a lot shorter. Have you guys ever run across anyone who's done something really stupid or embarrassing in the course of a divorce? <coughs> Not yet. <laughs> we all have. I mean, Marianne, Michelle, Monica, Steve, can you guys all attest all that? All the time. Yeah, like 50% of our job is PR. Yeah, like, guys, the reason my client did that. that was because it was Saturday night at 11 o'clock and he was really concerned about whether his mail had come. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe, yeah. but it's true. So that's how I got the name Flacco. What percentage of divorces in Arizona are going through this process? And it goes well, out so well, yeah. 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 Very few people know about it. It's, it's in its early stages. I mean, it's old. It's old in process. It's 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, but people are really just are getting to know the process. So a lot, that's why we're doing a lot of what we're doing, because it's that marketing. It's almost everywhere again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, also um, Mike, you mentioned that list of attorneys. And then the longer list of, they're almost horrible, right? That was me. Okay, well, does anyone here dispute that that most people on that list are out there telling their clients, oh, you don't want to use collaborative law. It's not right for your case. Right. They don't, they've never been to that sushi restaurant. They don't know if the sushi is good. And they're telling their clients never eat there. And that's exactly what we're, what we're dealing with. We're having to convince people, no, we've actually been to that restaurant. We've had everything on the menu, and it's awesome. And we've been to other restaurants that are worse, and we can tell you why. Yeah. It's High five. <laughs> yes. So my yeah. question, a question: Are you guys all independent uh, contractors, and then you, yeah. you've come together uh, to work work as a team, or yes. uh, the clients will pick their? <coughs> there's a list of trained mm -hmm. professionals, and so the clients will pick their attorney. If they're using a financial professional, they'll pick them. If they're using a coach, they'll pick them from that list. We're not affiliated together other than trying to spread the word. But one person uh, like that, husband or wife, will uh, either, I mean, how do you guys advertise? How do you, you know, is there, is there one name, one contact, and then that contact says, okay, well, you know, Nope. Here's, here's the list. The it's just called Best Legal Prices website. website. That's it. Oh. And all professionals are listed there with each of our independent websites. And a consumer, it's really to put information out to the consumers that there's an alternative to litigation. Um, all of us kind of found each other over the years because we were each individually doing this and pushing the message out into the community. And we all said, why don't we come together and use our collective knowledge and experience and help push the information out through one consolidated website to give consumers one point of contact to learn about this because there's power in coming together and sharing that versus each of us doing it separately we couldn't get enough momentum so you're a coalition or you're a no nope. we're, 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 we're just yeah. you're just members but we're a collective of people who all have a shared philosophy that this is the best process available to families to, to people to resolve legal disputes where they have to continue mm -hmm. to cooperate and they have a high stakes interest that's hard to divide so we all agree that we're all independent but I'm not in Monica's pocket, DJ's not in my seat. Every single person here is going to exercise their own independent judgment and discretion. We are all independent businesses. Um, I don't, Monica, I've never seen Monica's bank statements. Michelle's never seen mine. None no, of that. But how, how, but how, we're so all independent. Let's just cut to it. How, how do you get paid by one client collectively as? We don't. No, no, no. No, no. They hire me or they hire, I can meet with Marianne. I can meet with Monica and Michelle for clients and Steve. My okay. clients pay me, and Jennifer's clients pay yeah. her, and Michael's clients pay me. Right, yes. Yeah. And we all have cases right now where we have cases with each other and with other professionals in the community. Yeah. I have two collaborative cases right now that are not with anyone that's part of Best Legal Choices, but they're other collaboratively trained professionals. Client found me, and the spouse found someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're directing clients in any way. It's just we believed coming together to share information, to push that information out into the community, that the more people who know about this, the better it is for everyone, whether they hire us or not. I mean, obviously, we'd love for them to hire us, yeah. but we just want families to know this is an option and to look at this as an option. And you said the key thing there is getting it out there. Correct. And that's why we're doing the best we can to get you exactly. out in front of people because 
it's something a lot of people don't know about and it's yeah so and yeah, basically we questions. just pooled resources to educate okay. the public okay. and other lawyers okay. and let's face it if i get a case with marianne or michelle or Monica or steve and they're opposing me as an attorney i know that i'm going to have a more likely <laughs> possibility of a successful outcome because i know how each of these people communicates we've all gotten to know each other we work well together and so it's seamless it's far more seamless than if someone from outside of our group maybe you guys have that big we'll show. List. Do you have that big list in your office where you see you have a case you're like, ah, oh, yes. are you yes. against that person? Or I don't have it at all. <laughs> or we decline because we find out who the other attorney is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've yeah. had your hand for a while, so I want to make sure we give you a chance to ask your question. So how, how, how does this relationship correlate with us as the agent in, in, in real life? Like, you know, let's just say... You know, we've got this house under contract, we're in inspections, and these guys can't agree whether or not they're going to make these repairs or blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Do they come to you, or are you in communication with us, or how does that play out? I mean, how, how, how does that give us, or is there any edge well, you for have, us? You have had the opportunity to hear a little bit from each of us. You can contact any of us at any time to get to know us better. Um, but I see this presentation as being showing you a resource for some of your clients. And I think uh, from the attorney's perspective, sometimes they're, they're going to need an agent or someone to sell a house. And mm -hmm. if we get to know you a little bit better, we know that you're going to treat your people fairly and well, we would, I'm assuming, make referrals back. So. Uh, well, yeah. I guess that's the, maybe that's not what I, I was saying. I, I, think was, I, uh, I think I may know what you're getting at. So the I mean, case I basically, we just send them to you and then just have faith that those problems don't no. happen. Well, because we're <laughs> no. going to help them walk through those things. Because okay. a lot of that is about feeling. It's about, you know, fairness. It's about all the, you know, making sure that, you know, I'm getting things my way. But we're going to try and make sure that they can actually. Because, you know, we're, we're always them. trying to guide our clients as to, you know, doing <laughs> what's, you know, probably in their best interest. Right. But in the end, they're the boss. They're going to do what they want right. to do. Well, and I always <laughs> say team so that they can get the most out of the house, get, get most of their best interests met. And I want to say, because I did have the case in the last year where there was a real estate agent involved, the parties agreed that I could update the realtor. And they agreed that the realtor could update me on the status of the house. So I worked in conjunction with conveying information to the realtor and the mortgage broker to make sure that the transaction moved along smoothly so that they didn't start looking for a house before they knew we could finish things, right? And then if we got to that stage, we were all working together to get the right disclaimer deeds signed, the mortgage lined up, but the parties agreed. So that's why I said it depends on the case, but in that case, the parties were working together with the realtor and they wanted the realtor part of the team. So there was two meetings that the realtor showed up at the meeting because it was about the properties. And so they wanted the realtor to be there and we recommended the realtor should be there because that realtor was gonna be the one showing them houses and helping them make decisions well, we don't want the realtor to be in the dark. So I'm a big proponent of bringing in additional professionals when needed to help get those outcomes, and we've done it in other cases. And I know every one of us have done that where we've brought in other professionals when the team feels that's needed and the clients want it. And if they're working with a realtor, I would say my opinion is bring them into the team. So a good question you know, on top of that is uh, when you have two people who are you know, in the process and you have a home that's listed for sale and you, you get an offer, Okay, now those two people aren't together. Who do you present the offer to? You know, you're presenting the offer to one client, and the other one gets pissed off because they didn't do it. Or they both get copies of the of the offer, or you have one person who's like, you know, on your team would say, "Hey, we got the offer, and let's talk about it." Well, in the interest of transparency, for example, if I'm mailing, mailing one client, I automatically copy the other one on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no behind the scenes anything. Everything is totally transparent. Well, and, and just to add to that, there is still attorney-client privilege and confidential communication between the attorney and the client, but to the extent that the client might reveal mm -hmm. something to the attorney that would not be consistent with collaborative principles, mm -hmm. if my client says, hey, I have a condo in China, don't tell the other side, mm -hmm. I can't tell the other side, but I have to withdraw from the case mm -hmm. because I can't then fulfill my duty to the collaboration itself. I still have my duty to my client. I will never <coughs> tell anybody about that condo, but I can't be on the case anymore. They've made me the turn already. What's the percentage of um, people that come to you without, an, without a real estate agent and then 
What do you do with that from there? 90% mm -hmm. probably, tell me less about it. Yeah, they haven't, sometimes they haven't made the decision to sell or they, right. they want to but haven't taken that right. step. Mm -hmm. Decisions made during part of the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm including who the realtor is going to be or how they're going to be selected. Right. If, right. if the two parties can't agree, then maybe their agreement is that among the team, we'll select someone for them. For their, for their vetting, of course. But, so you know, the board referrals even send you guys, there's a possibility you'll send referrals back. And just that's, know to the extent they come to us, because I've had this happen where a realtor does send a family in and they're in that process, I'm not going to send them to someone else. So just know that none of us would do that to you guys. I know sometimes at the back of your mind, it's like, well, what if I send them and then they send them to another realtor? That's not going to happen. No, that that's not within problem. our integrity. But I think to your point, it does create relationships because if we don't already have realtors and they do look to us, well, now we have a list and we can say, well, these are great people who support collaborative, who are going to work with your family to achieve a common goal and objective. Because we know if you bought into the process, you're coming from the right place that we are. Exactly. We would love the communication from you guys. I just learned something last week about Arizona law that I didn't know. I wouldn't have any reason to know. But uh, a couple is getting a divorce, and I don't know if it's collaborative or not, but he wanted to simply buy her out of the equity analysis. The reason he called me, he says, Teresa, the house isn't going in the market. You would be named in the divorce decree as the listing agent if it went that far. He goes, but I'm not ready to sell. I'm going to buy her out. And he has me uh, put the calculations together for the title company, the commissions, <coughs> and allowing for deferred maintenance, taking that, what he thought at that moment, off the top, yeah. which was at least $60,000, that, uh, and then he would divide the remainder, 50-50. Then he found out, he says, I'm sorry I didn't contact the lawyer and learn this, that if I'm buying her out, mm -hmm. there, there are no fees. You take the appraised value, and then what the mortgage is, mm -hmm. and that's the amount that's divided in half. There are no real estate fees that are divided in and half. And that's case law. There is that, no deferred uh -huh. maintenance that's divided but in that's half. That's a good example, though, of that's what the law says. Mm -hmm. But they can agree to something different. Mm -hmm. We actually just had a case where they decided to allow half of the selling costs, mm -hmm. which they can do by agreement. And, well, and she they wasn't agree. that. But, but in this <laughs> the, case, they The law was on her side. What he then didn't understand is, now that I've learned that, and thank you for all that work that you did, but now that I've learned that, I really don't see why she doesn't allow me to buy her out because it benefits her by forty thousand dollars. Right, right, because if right. Right, buyout doesn't happen and the house gets sold, they both lose. Yes, what, yes, what but that tenants. case law mm -hmm. says maybe she just doesn't want you in the house, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which makes me think it may not be collaborative. And that that isn't the way it always was. I mean, that case is not how old is that case? Yeah. Ten yeah. years ago, maybe. I mean, prior to prior to, prior to that, we generally we looked at at yep. like ten percent at least mm -hmm. would be cost of sale from you take value, the they had a professional certified appraisal and and they both agreed on that price and that's where the difference of the equity is so there's a four hundred thousand dollar window that was there and but when was that case law then i don't remember when that case yeah, i think it was a little longer oh, than that, that. So it was 10 right? closer to 10. Maybe eight or so, eight, nine, roughly, yeah. <coughs> roughly. And it comes point. up a lot. It comes up in mediation. It comes and up I'm in litigation. Though. I would have thought you would take those fees off the top, and this is what the real effort no. is. Mm -hmm. No. Well, you know, we've been through all these, mm -hmm. what do we call them, recessions? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone, oh, yeah. we've gone yeah, from the yeah. big issue was dividing the equity to several years ago, the big right. issue is what do we do with this albatross that we're yeah. underwater on? Yeah. Uh -huh. How much debt do uh, we share in? You know, so it's always a quandary. For so, because hey, mm -hmm. you made the comment, maybe it's not a collaborative case. And I think there's a misperception that in order for collaborative to be successful, the couples have to be friendly with each other or in communication. We actually have a case right now. There's a significant, I mean, significant history over 20 years of domestic violence, a verbal, mental domestic violence that the children have witnessed. The children are estranged from the father. There's some financial issues going on, and yet they're committed to the process because they know it will be a better outcome and then during this process we can address the domestic violence and help wife rebuild back up self-esteem we can reunify father with his children and repair that relationship and we're working on a plan to help this family move through that process move on with their lives 
And they're good people who didn't realize the pattern went both ways over this 20 years. They have a very dysfunctional pattern. So this is a case where we can't start them in the room together. We're having to keep them separate. We have to limit the time of meetings because it's too intense, yet they're committed to the outcome. So I just want to challenge you that just because people don't agree, they can be yelling, they can be screaming, if they're committed to a better outcome for their family, it's at least worth a screening to see if it's an appropriate case for collaborative, because most that. can be. Because once we do, like, I do child specialist work mm -hmm. too, and what we do there, a lot of times, the house is a big thing, so I want to get my children in the house, I don't want to disrupt them. That's right. Like, because a lot of, yeah, right. all of it. And she so, could not afford to stay in the house. Right? And, and sometimes you can't. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. they do end up having to move for financial reasons mm -hmm. or relocation reasons, whatever. And a lot of times, you know, when adults are going through these, emotions, they don't really know how to talk to their children. They don't know, someone feels guilty, someone says, you know, well, I didn't want the marriage, so I don't want to talk to them, you know, whatever it is. And so I can come in and kind of say, you know what, this is what your child needs, because the children want to please the parents, and they don't want to be in the middle. So sometimes they'll just kind of say whatever the parents want them to say. Um, but I can kind of talk to them and kind of work them through and kind of help them understand, this is where your child is. And you know what, I understand the child's attached to the house, and everything. <coughs> but do you know that little John is okay with moving if he has to? And this is kind of a way to talk to him about that and the reality of this. And this is the way that I need both of you involved. And he's really actually attached to both of you, and, but he just has different relationships. And kind of helping them work through that and how to minimize some of the impact and things like that. So we kind of work all together. But working with that also, you know, letting him know, by the way, this animosity is hurting your child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring you guys together and get you through this so that because one person that you're not thinking about in here is the impact of your child watching all this. And they're in the middle because they don't decide what to do. Can I tell my war story? Mm -hmm. You have to. You so this will give you a better idea of why we're doing this. I've been litigating cases for over 40 years. So um, Jennifer and I had a case. We had never worked together on a collaborative case before. We had a litigated case <laughs> a couple years ago and, and, and I'm scared of him. <laughs> her, her client was the wife who had filed an order of protection against my guy and wasn't letting him see his kids. Now, you know what that generally creates? A lot of anger, frustration, I mean, he was ticked off. He was not a happy guy. And they had a business they had to deal with, and it was a mess. And so we showed up the first day of court, and we're ready to do battle. I mean, we're ready to go in front of the judge, start battling this out. I want my guy to start seeing his kids. And so we talked briefly, and I said, you know, this guy really doesn't want a divorce. I mean, he's mad, but he doesn't understand why she's doing this. And so Jennifer went and talked to her client and came back and said, what do you think about doing this collaboratively? We've both been trained. And I said, all right, so we went and told the judge, we decided we don't want to hear it today. We're going to pull this case out and try and resolve it. Do so you remember we, what the judge said to us? Yeah, he what? said, what's that? Yeah. He goes, this uh, collaborative law thing, I guess. Hope, hope it works out. Yeah, like, yeah. He didn't know what it was. It was so, law. <laughs> so we, we realized, we met with them one time and realized their big issue was, was financial. That, that they were both all stressed out because they were behind, they were underwater on stuff, couldn't afford things, that the husband was working all the time trying to make ends meet, the wife thought he was he was ignoring her and the kids and not spending any time with them. So she was mad at him for that. And it was just, you know, they didn't communicate at all. So we got Mike involved um, doing helping him with the finances. Anyway, bottom line is they reconciled. So there's a case where they ended up they ended up filing bankruptcy, I think. They got out of their house and then we ended up getting a realtor to sell the house for them. Um, and they, they worked things out and got back together. So it was a great result. But one of the reasons I didn't want to take that case in front of the judge, um, and you, you guys probably don't know this, but we've got a huge trial court here in Maricopa County. We've got 100 judges, 50 commissioners, one of the largest trial courts in the country because this is such a big county. And um, the family law judges are generally, that, that's the first assignment a new judge gets. <laughs> Most of those judges do not have a background in family law. They come from everywhere. I mean, they're prosecutors, they're commercial litigators, they're stock broker guys, you know, whatever. They do transactional work. So they come in, so I can tell you, on this, the lawyers on this panel have more knowledge of family law than probably half of the family law judges right now because they're new, they're in their first year being sitting on the bench. So you're taking your complicated case in front of someone who doesn't have a lot of experience in this area just wants to hear the evidence and get to a decision 
they don't want to you know spend a lot of time burning brain cells to figure mm -hmm. it out they're expecting the lawyers to tell them what to do the lawyers are advocating for their clients so we're both telling them opposite things right mm -hmm. and it's a mess seriously it is a mess and they give because they have so many family law cases what is it 18,000 Last there year, 18,000 filed last year that were divorces. I think there were 35,000 domestic relations cases okay. total. So the like largest half, number of cases, half yeah, largest number of cases filed are in the family law bench. It's every year, so year every one of those judges is got a heavy caseload. Mm -hmm. So they have restricted our time. <laughs> most cases, once in a while, we get an exception, but most cases, we have <laughs> two, two to three hours. <laughs> To resolve all of the issues between <laughs> two people that are separating their lives. That includes the kids, spousal maintenance, dividing up all their property. I get about an hour and a half of testimony on my from my from my own client and the other side to resolve that. It is not a good system. It's what we got. And I'm not saying the judges don't try. I mean they're people, they they're trying to do the right thing. But you are way better off not letting the judge decide your case in mm -hmm. almost every case. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> and I sat as a judge for 15 years old. It's right. kind of the equivalent of having two more judges in the room in terms of our experience. We've seen what all the judges will do, and we've also got a lot more experience. Um, one thing I just wanted to touch on, because I, I mentioned earlier that this isn't just for divorce. This is actually something that people can use. This is a process people can use for other purposes. And so I just wanted to kind of make sure you guys saw this list. Um, you, you may have probate court cases as well. There are, I want to say there are like 12,000 guardianship and conservatorship cases filed last year in Maricopa County. So probate can often force the sale of a home. And if you want to talk about something worse than warring spouses, mm -hmm. try warring adult siblings. Have fun with that. Um, so we, some of us do probate. I actually do probate cases. I, I enjoy doing probate cases. <coughs> um, I would love to see probate and collaborative law collide. Um, it, but right now it's, it's hard enough just to get into the divorce mm -hmm. realm. But you know, you also might have a family a business or a for sale of a business where the um, business operates out of some owned real estate. Uh, and so there are a number of potential <laughs> ways that collaborative law can intersect with legal issues. Like for example, I'm looking at the list there talking about uh, guardianships of loved ones or wills and trusts. Uh, I've been called in a couple high profile cases. One guy was 107 years old and uh, he, he needed to have uh, his capacity verified because he wanted to change his will so much. He had been really messy case and he was running over to them three times in the, <laughs> in the end. But uh, you know, there, there's a lot of ways where the mental health side can assist with some of these things too. If you, you start going through that list, okay. all, where would you need a, a mental health professional uh, to be involved in a lot of these? Uh, we, we've got contract disputes, okay. uh, any kind of family thing you were probate and things like that to get more of the siblings uh, halfway close to being on the same page. Anytime people have to continue to cooperate <laughs> on anything, if they can't fully divide equally and they just have this shared interest and it's high stakes to both of them. And it can be anything. I mean, it can, I see you've got your puppy with you. Right. It can be a pet. It can be, we all, probably many of us love dogs on this panel. Mm -hmm. I know DJ does. <laughs> and so, you know, it can be anything. We, I mean, I have had entire divorce cases over a dog. That's like, that's $12,000 in legal fees. I mean, she took the dog and he wants it back. And so it can be anything that people can't work out. And so not to end on that note, I think it's, you know, really about the kids and about the house. And those are usually the, the big, dog. it's about the dog. But I think that that's, <laughs> and you raise a good point, Jim, because we've had several cases where, I mean, under the law, they're property. They are. Dog is property. I'll tell you, as a pet, <laughs> my pet probably is treated better than my kid. My child um, like, is a right? <laughs> so, I mean, pets are really personal to people, and we have a lot of time spent working through that. I mean, I've had shared custody agreements that get worked out on the pet because that's what the family needs, right, for the kids, for the adults involved. You go to a court, the judge is like, it's property. Um, talk about demeaning something of value to people. And, and it's not the judge's fault, to C's point, the judge, I mean, they care as much as they're able to, but the law is the law. That's the beauty of collaborative, is we can say, okay, the law says X, but let's talk about maybe Y is the better outcome for your family if we can agree to it. So, I mean, I wanna end for sure Just because that. dogs are a lot more loyal than kids. That's true, that's true. Shorter commitment too, right? Not like a lifetime of them. Sending money off the door. website, Thank you.
Do we, do we get a we band up? We got some of the brochures. Mm -hmm. right I have a few brochures, and they're all just with my card. And I, I have a few. You have a few too. I would like to have cards for every single person on this panel, and every single person who doesn't want to get you. I have some cards. Have a yeah. few cards with me, and Wendy does too. But I'd love to have everyone's cards because I had people in my office yesterday who were like, "Can you spend their thirty cards?" So who can I? Who can we send anything to, or Andy, do you want to take care of that? Yeah, we'll send it to Kelly. And then okay. Kelly and then, you know, okay. I just had a meeting with some advisors. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, I know. This is really fun. You guys are going to get out of here. I was born in Arizona. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.